For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Hello, welcome to today's Christmas uh, broadcast discussion and symposium by the Schiller Institute. Uh, we are going to be discussing a very specific topic today, which is supplanting tragedy with creativity. Uh, in order to be able to discuss this, there are ideas that we want to refer to, some of which are well known to people and some of which are going to be very new to you. Uh, we want to, for, for example, quickly just to say something about December 25th and why December 25th was picked as the traditional date for the birth of Christ. Uh, there's a couple of things that were said by, for example, Augustine uh, in, a, in, a, in a sermon, which I'd like you to uh, hear uh, read to you now. Hence it is that he was born on the day which is the shortest in our earthly reckoning and from which subsequent days begin to increase in length. He, therefore, who bent low and lifted us up, chose the shortest day, yet the one whence light begins to increase. Sermon 194 Augustine, A.D. 354-430 to When Augustine preached his Christmas sermons, the actual connection between December 25th and the winter solstice had ceased to exist as much as 400 years earlier. Selden, the Anthropos, takes this as evidence that belief in the December 25th birth of Christ must have originated very early on, in apostolic times, while the association of the solstice with December 25th was still popularly retained. So the important idea here is that the concept of the birth of Christ, of creation, uh, was integrated with astronomical conceptions and of course the idea of the sudden shift from the darkest day of the year to the reoccurrence of light. Uh, yes, it's true that the Christian holiday was also a supplanting of pagan rituals, the Saturnalia, which was a particular festival, Dionysian-like festival that was celebrated at the time, but there's deeper implications to, to all of this, which was the idea that tragedy can be swallowed up in victory. Um, we are going to be applying this idea today specifically to the notion of physical economy and the fact that if we look at the present crisis in which the transatlantic world in one sense the entirety of civilization is presently involved this is not a pandemic this is not one uh, or two crises this is a confluence of crises in which there's a moral crisis also that confronts the civilization and this is not because the ideas which would provide for progress and for human development are not present, it's because those ideas have been largely, tragically, summarily rejected. And when we look at the presidential election of 2020 in the United States, we're seeing that kind of crisis in which the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence and the principles which have allowed the United States to be the most successful republic in history are themselves largely unavailable to be used uh, by the electorate and by the citizens in general, precisely because there's been a collapse in the culture, the culture of productivity and the cultural, culture of creativity. It's believed, particularly uh, uh, Lyndon LaRouche asserted, that much of this had to do with the unfortunate sudden hegemony of the concept of mathematics and that mathematics was the seat of or origin point for both science and creativity. That was a, a standpoint that Lyndon LaBruche summarily rejected. But he also offered a higher conception, uh, which is exemplified here in one discussion that we are going to be having or showing you of his conception of the tensor. And he's going to apply this in, in two fields. Now, we actually began talking about this last week, and I would refer people to last week's uh, discussion by Jason Ross, in which he uh, it introduces this idea. But here we're going to hear Lyndon LaBruche apply this in two areas economy, and music. The only way you can solve the design of an economy and its functioning is with a tensor approach. It's the only way the human mind can understand and deal with the complexity. Yeah. See, you're not dealing with one industry competing with another. 
money has no value. Yeah. Money is a, a, the, a value of money is an approximation taken for purposes of lending mm. because it's loans that determine mm -hmm. the, the capital, the create capital. So now, but the physical values are what determine that, and the most important of the physical values is human creativity, mm -hmm. human scientific creativity, which is not mathematical. Right. So therefore, you need a system of organization of the, this complexity of different so-called factors. And constant change and modulation. Exactly. Yeah. One of the interesting points you're making then is that even with the perfect intonation, as you bring in the other voices, you sometimes have to have a slight modification to make well, the counterpoint function. What you have to understand is you have to now look at the tensor. And if you take the Bach uh, system, well-tempering system, with all the keys, and if you do the way that, look at the way that has to be performed, because most people make a mess of the performance of the preludes and fugues, Out of, because they play the notes. Yeah. Or then they interpret the notes as they play, which means they complicate the message. Better they should play only play the notes without trying to interpret the notes, it, because they, they make a worse mess of everything. Mm -hmm. And most of the recordings of this kind of work from Bach is a mess. Yeah. It has no coherence. It has freakishness, and people go for the freakishness of the performance, yeah. not for its intent. Yeah. Because you have, you have to intonate based on the peculiarities of the irony of counterpoint. Yeah. Now, what you ha the, the, if you look at the Bach Fugue that way, uh, as, as from the t uh, look at the whole series mm -hmm. of about two sets of preludes and fugues, you see that that's the principle. You have to perform these things with irony, the natural irony in it. Now, what do you do? You're overlaying these voices. Huh? So it's a progressive buildup. Mm -hmm. And at the conclusion, you have completed the orbit. Huh. Huh? You've defined the composition. You haven't defined the composition until you get to the conclusion. Because the composition is based on progressing to a certain idea, which is not located in the notes. Because what's more important is you have to look at the geometry. Mm -hmm. And when you shift, when you make a, a shift from one key or one instrument to the other, mm -hmm. which have a different intonation, uh, the first violin must be different than the second, uh, and so forth. Now we're going to apply that same idea of the tensor in the area that people call politics. There was an article in November of 2000 that Lynn LaRouche wrote called Politics as Art. And what we're going to do now is hear an excerpt from that article, and then we'll uh, be hearing a, uh, from a, an interview, an actual discussion that happened earlier this morning that was done by Helga Sepp LaRouche and Harley Schlanger uh, on statecraft. Real politics as Plato and the recently elevated great and martyred English statesman Thomas More rightly understood, is properly practiced as a form of classical art, practiced according to the same principles which the greatest tragedians, Shakespeare and his successor Schiller most notably, subsequently expressed as classical modes of composition and performance of poetry and tragedy. To become efficiently literate in history and politics, you must recognize the tragedies composed by those two latter greatest masters of that art as no mere fiction, but like the greatest operatic staging of the tragedies from Shakespeare and Schiller by Giuseppe Verdi, or earlier the relevant operas of Wolfgang Mozart and Beethoven's Fidelio, the authentic and inspiring representation of the essence of the specific crises in real history to which those compositions refer. So in this period of, of chaos and disinformation, Helga, what, what's your uh, thoughts on, on where we're headed as we come to a new year? Well, I think that that is an open question because it is not just an objective necessity which will unfold, but it is very much also dependent on what is the subjective factor. How do the people of the world react to a situation which is indeed incredible. 2020 will go into history as for sure in the memory of most people as an annus horribilis, as a horrible year where you had <clears throat> the pandemic, you had mass unemployment, you had insecurities about the future. 
And if you look into the coming year, well, there are certain parameters which we already know and we will talk about it. But um, before I go into the details of that, let me remind you that the Schiller Institute, which was now founded uh, almost 37 years ago, was founded not just as the normal think tank or NGO of some sort, but it was deliberately founded as an institute to promote statecraft. Now, many people ask, you know, what is statecraft all about? Well, it is very important. And the key to it, if you want to study it, look at the aesthetical letters of Friedrich Schiller. Um, and yet there you will find you know, a discussion which, which is so actual and so, uh, you know, as if it would be written for today, because he says, how comes that we are still barbarians. How comes that we are in such a horrible condition? And remember that he wrote that after the collapse of the French uh, Revolution, which ended in the Jacobin terror. And, uh, you know, the aesthetical letters by Schiller were his answer, where he said, what needs to be done that this never happens again? And in the second letter, he actually says, that the most important work of art uh, is actually the construction, the building of true political freedom. And, you know, he calls that the highest form of art, which I think is quite telling because statecraft in that sense, you know, to make uh, not only governments and nations function, <clears throat> but to make sure that the politics and everything that is being done in, in the realm of politics is serving the common good, is serving peace, is serving the cooperation of nations together for a higher purpose of the one mankind. So statecraft, and this will become apparent to you if you read the entire aesthetical letters and other writings and dramas by, by Schiller, Shakespeare, uh, <clears throat> and so forth, is the question of how to improve the character of the people because you can blame the politicians and you can say you know this is all terrible they are corrupt they are this and that but the answer and that was also what my late husband Lyndon LaRouche said many times you know if you don't improve the moral character of the population at large there is no guarantee that the republic will function so what Schiller does in the aesthetical letters, he says, how comes that we are in this condition when the governments are depraved, corrupt, and the masses of the population are passive, they are not, you know, they are not up to it. Where does the solution come from? And he gives the beautiful answer, which is developed over a lot of letters. The answer is in great art, and you have to find the aesthetical education in every single person and uplift them that way so that they can actually be the guarantor that the republics uh, are functioning. Now, if you apply that for the coming year, um, well, I mean, we know what the uh, enemy is up to. Uh, <clears throat> the World Economic Forum has planned a virtual big show, I think between the 25th and 29th of January, where they want to devote all of that to the Great Reset, you know, to basically impose the dictatorship of the central banks by only allowing investment in green finance. And, you know, that would be the certain collapse of the industrial countries wherever this is applied for reasons which we can discuss later. But, you know, we already <clears throat> mentioned it many times, because if you impose low energy flux densities, which is the green agenda, into the economy, you lower the productivity of the economy in such a way that you lead to a collapse, population reduction. And, you know, it's a kind of utopia which cannot function economically. So this is what <clears throat> the oligarchy plan uh, plans. Uh, then we know uh, we have the election fight, to which we will come shortly, uh, the vote fraud fight. But then, you know, what will happen with the pandemic? Well, hopefully, <clears throat> by midsummer, there is enough vaccine produced 
so that many populations in the so-called advanced sector can be have can can be vaccinated but that does not solve the problem because it is the character of a pandemic that unless you remedy it in every single country of the planet it will come back it will mutate there's no way how you can be sure that the vaccine you have developed in the first place will be suitable for these mutations uh, and right now you have the uh, you know line that some countries like peru or mali will only get vaccines by 2023 24 i mean this is completely unacceptable so we have to find ways of accelerating the production of vaccines so that every single country can have access to them including the logistics for it and so forth then naturally you know in this coming months we are confronted with this pen, with this famine of which Beasley from the World Food Program has said it's of biblical dimensions. 270 million people are threatened in the coming months of starvation. That has to be remedied, and that can only go uh, into effect by doubling agricultural production. Then, you know, <clears throat> there are many other things which will happen in the course of this year. But the most important is to come back to this idea of statecraft we have to get a completely different idea of what politics is all about. It cannot be, you know, <clears throat> bureaucratic arrangements. It cannot be just keep your power for power's sake, uh, keep the population stupefied by silly entertainment. No, the opposite has to occur. We have to have a population around the world uplifted by classical culture, finding the roots of their own creativity, and that must also you know, guide the relations among nations because you know, only if we change the thinking to a completely new paradigm where the respect for the creativity in the other human individual, the respect for the potential of the other nation, the working together for the common aims of the one humanity, only if we can implement that paradigm shift do we have chance to avoid catastrophe. So I think it, that, you know, th we should start the new year with reflections of that, reading the dramas of Shakespeare, of Schiller, of reading the aesthetical writings and other theoretical writings of Friedrich Schiller, read the Federalist Papers, read Leibniz, read Plato, read Schiller on <coughs> Likurk and Solon, where he discusses the difference between a republic and <coughs> an oligarchy. I think we have to elevate the level of discussion of the population as the most urgent task if we want to get safely and successfully through the coming year. Now, tragedy need not be the necessary condition of humanity or of this society of which we are members. That's what, of course, the transatlantic world has sort of condemned itself to, largely because of the popularity of the ideas that have ruled for the past half century. The fact that most societies have disappeared themselves in history does not mean that this one necessarily has to do th that as well. But the kind of ideas that would have to be made available are exactly those that have been least popular uh, and have now become largely unfamiliar. What we've tried to do today is to put together a panel uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Christmas holiday of yesterday, in the case of the United States, other persons celebrated, of course, from other days. We want to take the opportunity to have a symposium kind of discussion about the things that you've just heard and specifically sort of uh, orbiting around uh, this conception that Lyndon LaRouche introduced, which he refers to as the tensor, but as you see, is applied in different ways, in different circumstances. And so I'd like to just uh, introduce now some of the people who will be with us. We have uh, Matthew Ogden from Virginia. I see Diane Sayre, who is, of course, always here. She's always the co-moderator. And what we're going to do is we're going to start out with first uh, the two of them. And then this will be followed by some respondents. We'll get into a certain kind of discussion. So we're going to begin with Matthew. Matt? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Yes, you're very clear. Wonderful. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me to participate in this discussion. And I think that the idea of this international symposium, uh, this Think Like Beethoven symposium is an excellent one for the new year. 
and should absolutely be continued and expanded and developed. Uh, what I actually want to do is go back and return to the opening statement of that article by Lyndon LaRouche, which you cited, Dennis, Politics as Art, uh, and read the very beginning, the opening paragraph, which actually preceded the excerpt which was read earlier in this broadcast. This is what Lyndon LaRouche said in the very beginning. He wrote, Some winced or giggled when the amiable and gifted Senator Eugene McCarthy conducted political campaigning as poetry reading sessions. I laugh happily at what he did. Senator McCarthy's critics did not remember, as I do, that President Lincoln had won a terrible, justified, and absolutely necessary war on behalf of all humanity by aid of lessons adduced from Shakespeare, which he had taught as directives to the members of his cabinet. No one friend or foe, laughed at the awesome result of that instruction. Real politics, as Plato rightly understood, is properly practiced as a form of classical art. So LaRouche cites Senator Eugene McCarthy, the late Senator McCarthy, conducting poetry reading sessions with his youth movement volunteers during the 1968 campaign for president. Um, Later, Eugene McCarthy came to be a friend and a very, low, uh, very vocal proponent of Lyndon LaRouche's exoneration after his unjust imprisonment. Um, I was honored to have the occasion several times to meet Senator McCarthy, uh, who maintained contact with my mother, uh, Nina Ogden, up to the point that he passed away and remained politically in touch with Mr. LaRouche up to that time. And I recall during meetings with him that he was just as passionate about discussing and debating Homer's compositional methods and compositional techniques in the Iliad and the Odyssey as he was about discussing and strategizing how to stop Bush and Cheney's fraudulent and criminal war in Iraq. In fact, he, um, he regularly published these allegorical and hilariously ironic animal stories about Bush and Cheney and the rest of what he scathingly called the bestiary in publications of the LaRouche movement. Um, and when he was asked to sign an open letter calling for Linda LaRouche's exon exoneration after LaRouche's unjust imprisonment, Eugene McCarthy said, quote, how could I not add my name in defense of a man who has brought Plato and Schiller back into politics and was sent to jail for it? So as LaRouche says in that article, uh, Politics as Art, which he wrote actually on the eve of the 2000 contested presidential election campaign, he said that real politics, as Schiller understood it, is properly practiced as a form of classical art. And this recalls, as Helga just mentioned, a statement by Friedrich Schiller, that the greatest work of art is the creation of political freedom. Or Schiller's directive in his essay, Theater Considered as a Moral Institution, and I think we have an image from this, that the true goal of great art, specifically great drama, is to cause men and women to become better and to uplift society as a whole. This is what he had to say. This is Friedrich Schiller. He said, here on the classical stage, in this lofty sphere, the great mind, the fiery patriot, first discovers how he can fully wield his powers. Such a person lets all previous generations pass in review weighing nation against nation, century against century, and finds how slavishly the great majority of the people are ever languishing in the chains of prejudice and opinion, which eternally foil their strivings for happiness. He finds that the pure radiance of truth illumines only a few isolated minds who probably had to purchase that small gain at the cost of a lifetime's labors. By what means, then, 
can the wise legislator induce the entire nation to share in its benefits? The theater is the common channel through which the light of wisdom streams down from the thoughtful, better part of society, spreading thence in mild beams throughout the entire state. And then, at last, in all districts and regions and classes, with all his chains of fad and fashion cast away, and every bond of destiny rent asunder, when man becomes his brother's brother, with a single all-embracing sympathy, resolved once again into a single species, forgetting himself and the world, and reapproaching his own heavenly origin. Each takes joy in others' delights, which then, magnified in beauty and strength, are reflected back to him from a hundred eyes, and now his bosom has room for a single sentiment, and this is to be truly human. So, for those of you who are familiar with the text of Friedrich Schiller's Ode to Joy, which was set by Beethoven in the Ninth Symphony, those concluding words of this essay, Theater as a Moral Institutions, will clearly resonate with you. What did Schiller say in the Ninth Symphony? Deinet sauber binden wieder, was die Moda streng geteilt. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfte Flügel weilt. So as we celebrate Beethoven's 250th anniversary this year, uh, this celebration comes actually in the form of a challenge. And the challenge is to think like Beethoven. But that challenge, that directive, does not merely apply to the domain of musical composition and musical performance per se. It applies to the challenge of using classical art to achieve the greatest work of classical art, which is true political freedom. And I think as others on this panel can elaborate more, I'm sure, Beethoven himself was witness to the horrors of the Napoleonic Wars and lived through a time really not unlike our own in certain regards, when civilization found itself simultaneously both staring into the abyss, but also within reach of potentially fulfilling the promise of the American Revolution uh, and ushering in the age of reason. So the challenge to think like Beethoven is not just an abstract notion, but as many who are involved in this colloquy here know very well, in order to perform Beethoven's music, it's not enough to just sing the notes, such as the Misa Solemnis, for example, which is the grand project right now of the Schiller Community Chorus. Uh, one instead is forced to think like him. You, one must enter into Beethoven's mind, or probably rather, more truthfully, allow him to enter into your mind and to allow his ideas and the development of, of those ideas to be your motive force, to what's moving you, almost as if it was a, a physical force or a physical principle. And you can actually see this when you watch some of the greatest performers. It's almost like they are being guided by something, they're being moved by something external to themselves, like the planets around the sun, uh, as if they're under the influence of a physical force, um, gravitation in that case, or in the case of music, it's, it's the idea of the composer, something which is simultaneously radiating from within the performer, but is also something which is external to themselves. It's being projected across time from the mind of the composer, even if that composer be long dead, deceased. However, if those ideas are to have the ability to resonate in this way with us, the performers, there must be something internal to the performer which he or she has, has developed 
which allows that resonance process to occur. That's why no performance of a piece of music can ever be the same. This is a living, a living, breathing experience. The performance, therefore, with this resonance, it takes on the form almost as a dialogue. It's a dialogue between the mind of the performer and the mind of the composer, with the subject of that dialogue being the development of that musical idea. And this living process of musical performance, this is the challenge that we seek to achieve every time we, we, we get on that stage. And it's not just about reciting or executing a dead series of notes and making it sound perfect or um, uh, just uh, putting this on display as if you were a recording. Uh, it's rather a living dialogue process between two or more living human souls who are undertaking a shared process of discovery with each other. And they're experiencing together a shared experience of the beautiful emotion which arises from that process of shared discovery. And this is perhaps the best definition of what we mean by the classical principle in music. This is not an era, this is not a genre. Uh, classical, instead, is in the sense of the word Socratic or Platonic, like Plato's dialogues from classical Greece. So this process of resonance, um, this dialogue between the mind of the composer and the mind of the performer involving the minds of the audience. Uh, this resonance process, I think, is beautifully captured by the poet uh, Percy Shelley in his defense of poetry. I'm not going to summarize that in full, but he describes the poet as a lyre, one of these ancient Greek musical instruments, which is moved by an unseen wind. Or uh, in the end of that essay, he says the poet is the hierophant of an unapprehend unapprehended inspiration, the mirror of the gigantic shadows which futurity cast upon the present, as Shelley says. So, of course, uh, this dialogue, this process of shared discovery between our mind and the mind of the composer, the musical composer, I would assert, is the same as the dialogue process between our mind and the mind of our creator. What is called art or poetry on one hand is what we call science or philosophy on the other. It's exactly the same process. There is no distinction between art and science. These are one and the same. And the story of Einstein, Albert Einstein and his violin, uh, which in which he said that when he'd be really wrestling with a scientific problem, with a paradox, which he couldn't get his head around, that he'd retreat from the problem at hand and he'd, he'd retreat to his violin and he'd immerse himself in Mozart. That story from Einstein, this is not some gimmick. Um, great music is the recreational activity of the creative mind. Great art is where the, where the creative mind goes to replenish itself. And Einstein's dialogue with Mozart, the composer, was literally the exact same process as his dialogue with God, the creator. Um, and I think Einstein himself was very conscious of this. This is a, he, he wrote in an article that was published in 1930 in the New York Times Magazine. He described this process of what he called the cosmic religious feeling. Uh, which motivates the great scientist. This is, this is what Einstein had to say. He said, the individual feels the sublimity and the marvelous order which reveal themselves both in nature and in the world of thought. Individual existence impresses him as a sort of prison, and he wants to experience the universe as a single significant whole. How can this cosmic religious feeling be communicated from one person to another? In my view, this is the most important function of art and science, to awaken this feeling and to keep it alive in those who are receptive to it. 
And um, later he said elsewhere that his motive was to know the mind of God. Einstein said, I want to know how God created this world. I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. So, really, we must, we have to do the same with music, to seek to know the mind of the composer, of Beethoven. And I don't say this flippantly by any regards, it's clearly a monumental challenge. But luckily, just as God, the creator, wishes for us to know his mind, Beethoven himself, Beethoven also wishes for us to know his mind. That's what his music is all about, to invite us in and to engage us in a great Socratic dialogue over space and over time. But if such a dialogue is to function, we have to be willing to engage with that. And through this dialogue, it's, it's a process of unfolding, a process of becoming, which is a living experience. And though this dialogue with Beethoven might take the form of musical performance and musical composition, the subject by no means is music per se. The subject, as Einstein said, and let me paraphrase, ultimately, we are not necessarily interested in this or that phenomenon, in the theory or the notes or the sounds per se. We want to know his thoughts. Beethoven's thoughts, and the rest are details. And as Beethoven himself said, overcoming the experience of mere sound, of tone, this is, these were the words that he used to, to introduce Schiller's poetic text in the final movement of the Ninth Symphony, with the words of the, the baritone soloist, which thunders out above the orchestra, oh my friends, not these sounds. Nicht diesen Tonen. And then he implores, but rather let us sing of that which is even more pleasing and even more full of joy, from which follows an exultant and triumphal hymn to joy, to love, to human brotherhood, and to the Creator Himself. And in the conclusion of what is universally recognized as one of the greatest pieces of music ever written, what does Beethoven do? He doesn't say, this is, this is the piece of music and now it comes to an end. He ultimately points our attention away from the music itself. And he points our attention towards the heavens and the stars and the planets in their orbits. He says, wie die Sonne fliegen durch dem Himmels prächtigen Plan. And finally, he points our attention to the composer himself with a capital C, the creator who composed the entire universe and who resides, as Schiller says, above the stars themselves. Brüder übem Sternen selbst muss ein lieber Vater wohnen. Such ihn übem Sternen selbst, über Sternen muss er wohnen. Over, above, beyond the stars, beyond the things is where the creator lives. So I think that the uh, the best place to start this endeavor of seeking to think like Beethoven is in the f to follow in the footsteps of one who is undeniably one of the greatest performers of Beethoven of all time, the great conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler. And uh, there's a lot to say about Furtwängler, both historically, artistically, including his, and this maybe can be elaborated later, uh, current research into his actual association and active role in the anti-fascist resistance movement against the Nazis during his lifetime, as opposed to the defamation, which Furt Wengler is usually subjected to. I believe others can discuss this more. Maybe we can take that up in the discussion. But let me go directly to the point that I'd like to make about Furt Wengler's way of thinking. And that's what made him capable of resonating with the ideas of Beethoven in a way which I think many have tried to imitate, to mimic, but none so far have been able to fully match. And I believe that um, his insights will also serve as a, an indictment of sorts 
to the tendencies in music that he saw emerging around the turn of the century away from the ideal that Beethoven represented. And it's also a roadmap of sorts for us to recapture that the method of Beethoven and to use this Beethoven year, this extended Beethoven year, as an opportunity not to just heap empty praise on Beethoven's genius as if it's an unattainable goal uh, sitting on the top of some peak, mountain somewhere, but actually to recreate his genius within ourselves and to, to relive that genius and to create a true renaissance in its truest sense, a revival and a rediscovery of the method of Beethoven's mind. So um, I gave a, a more elaborated class on Wilhelm Furtwängler over this past summer as part of the Schiller Community Chorus uh, Summer Class Series, which was excellent. The whole series was excellent. Uh, but in the interest of keeping this presentation now abbreviated, I'd refer you to that discussion uh, in which I laid out a detailed presentation of what I asserted was Furt Wengler's epistemological understanding of the science of music and the science of the human mind, uh, which is really the subject of music. Uh, but right now, I'd just like to let Furt Wengler do some speaking for himself. I'd like to share, you, share with you the words of Furt Wengler in an essay that he wrote on Beethoven. And I think that what you will notice immediately is how much of what he says here, what Furt Wengler says here, resonates directly with what Linda LaRouche was saying in the beginning of this broadcast in that clip that was played, and what he always insisted, that music music resides between the notes, beyond the sensual effects, uh, and that the ironies that are inherent in great musical composition must cause us to understand the notes as such as mere vehicles for ideas which point away from themselves and towards the ideas which dwell far beyond the realm of mere sense perception. So here's what Furtwängler had to say about Beethoven. I do not intend to speak today about the famous composer we all believe we know, the composer who has an unshakable place in our culture, but about another composer, widely misinterpreted, largely misunderstood, and much abused. The illustrious Beethoven, the man we all claim we have in our possession, Beethoven, the great classic, has he any relevance for the youth of today as they gaze into the future? To be sure, his works are frequently enough performed and his appeal to the masses appear undiminished. Not so, however, to those more closely involved. For not only are professional musicians bored with what has become all too familiar, but it also seems as though the more modern, the more intense, and the more sophisticated a person's emotions are today, the more indifferent he feels towards Beethoven's music. What is the source of this paradox? One major difficulty with Beethoven, alongside Bach, the most complete and most perfect composer the world has ever seen, is that contrary to first appearances, there are no external means of access to his music. With its origins in itself, self-contained and self-sufficient, his music is ultimately impervious to any attempt to understand it from without. Instead of looking for Beethoven in his works, i.e. from his music, people have been trying to explain his music in terms of personal characteristics and thus make it more intelligible. But how different are his works? Never has an artist driven by an irresistible creative force felt so intensely the law that underlies artistic creation and submitted to it with such humility. To what extent the modern age comprehends this situation is a moot question. The only law that the present passive and unproductive age seems to acknowledge is the law of effect, effect achieved by any means. 
a merely correct or mediocre performance is a bad performance, the more so in the case of Beethoven than of any other composer, because it ignores what lies between the notes. And it is precisely there that the essence of the music resides. This music owes far less than that of other composers to specific sensory qualities. That is to say, when working out his ideas, Beethoven does not proceed primarily from the nature of the instruments or the voices through which he conveys these ideas. He adapts himself to the instruments he uses, but he never surrenders to their power. They are vehicles for ideas that go far beyond the realm of sense perception. Yet he is not abstract, as many think, not even in his last period. Rather, it is the fiery passion within him and the determination with which he keeps his eyes on the work as a whole that prevent him from pursuing the possibilities inherent in individual instrumental and vocal situations and from allowing himself to be carried away by these possibilities. This is why on certain occasions he will fail to exploit such possibilities, but on others will exaggerate and distort them. There are fortissimi which, though scored for ridiculously few instruments, have an inner drive and power which completely overshadow the explosive outbursts of a modern symphony orchestra. This reveals itself in performance. Confronted with the inner stresses and tensions of this music, all our genteel, refined, striving after artistry and euphony proves useless. Beethoven lies beyond the limits of what people call prettiness. The smoldering heat within his works consumes all who perform it, singers and instrumentalists alike. To change the metaphor, every work has to be wrenched from the very consciousness of whoever performs it. Only one thing will help the performer, the most important thing of all, namely for him to feel his way into the structure of the work as an entity, as a living organism. With Beethoven, the structure, or maybe better, architecture of the work is identical to the spiritual message. Foremost is the use of rubato, that almost imperceptible yet constant variation of tempo which turns a piece of music played rigidly according to the notes on the printed page into what it really is, an experience of conception and development of a living organic process. This naturally demands from the performer a relentless pursuit of clarity and an unyielding self-discipline combined with emotional intensity and infinite devotion. Today's fashionable cult of personal flair and intensity fails utterly in the face of these demands for it has no means of access to the organic, self-contained, and self-sufficient work of art. However accomplished a performer of this kind may be, he can only, when confronted by Beethoven, either behave like a headstrong rubato interpreter, or be led by his sense of style, as people call it, to divest himself entirely of his natural instincts and modern feelings and turn himself into a so-called classical musician. The latter tendency is, of the two, the more dangerous and fraught with disaster for the following reason. The powerful tensions in Beethoven's music make it necessary to observe a clarity and strictness of formal development, since otherwise the music would be consumed in its own flames. If the performer does not re-experience and relive the music each time anew, these formal elements will thrust themselves into the foreground, giving an impression of regulation and prescription 
of hackneyed repetition while draining the work of its energy, the vitality of its spiritual freedom, and giving the impression that it is the form that matters most. In a word, Beethoven is turned into a classical composer. And it is this much lauded classical Beethoven who prevails in the minds of most musicians, rules in our conservatories, and dominates the performances one hears, obstructing our view of the real Beethoven, destroying him day after day. Yet it never ceases to surprise me how obstinately loyal audiences actually remain to him. Can it be? The living heart of his music pierces even the densest of clouds around it? What strikes one above all about Beethoven and manifests itself to a greater extent in his music than in that of others is what I would call the inner law. More than any other composer, he seeks to uncover the laws of nature, the eternal truths, hence the extraordinary clarity of his music. The simplicity that dominates his work is not that of a naive or primitive artist, nor does it aim at achieving an immediate sensory effect like modern popular music. Yet no music makes its approach to the listener so directly, so openly, so nakedly, one might dare to say. Beethoven encompasses the whole of human nature in all its complexity. He is the universal genius. Beethoven has a modern relevance like that of no other composer. What nobility of emotion wells up in this most intimate of personal utterances. The most beautiful moments in his music speak of an innocence, a childlike purity, which in spite of all their human qualities, have an otherworldly aura about them. No composer has ever understood more about the harmony of the spheres or the inner peace of the Godhead. And it was from him that the words for Schiller's Ode to Joy, brothers, there must be a loving father living about the starry firmament, firmament received their true living meaning, a meaning that lies far beyond the reach of words. So those were the words of Furt Wengler uh, discussing Ludwig von Beethoven and teaching us how to think like Beethoven. So I would like to leave it at that at this point and then maybe just pursue more during, during the discussion period. Dennis, thank you. Tomorrow, U.S. Election Day, November 7, 2000, we shall witness an awful real-life tragedy on the world stage, the threat, if not yet the actuality, of a new dark age. That threat is today's outgrowth of a long-standing, widespread violation of those classical principles of statecraft which every citizen should have been given the right to know, something that citizen should have known by no later than the time he or she had completed a secondary education. Yes, I understand I was muted a moment ago, so let me just say what I was saying, which was that if you had just joined us, we were discussing the ideas that are going to be essential for us to be able to survive and maintain uh, the present, uh, survive this present crisis and maintain the republic. Uh, this was 20 years ago. The statement that you just said, it referred to the election, uh, which involved Al Gore and George W. Bush. If you look at today's circumstance, if anything, it's actually worse. It's a worse circumstance, a more dire circumstance, and certainly this prospect for a new dark age is one that uh, from the time that LaRouche first talked about it back in the year 2000, we began to do uh, things about. 
Uh, specifically back in 2014, Linda LaBruce introduced something called the Manhattan Project. And that Manhattan Project was something that he wanted to be done in the city of Manhattan for the purpose of restarting a kind of process around the American presidential system. Uh, in 2014, in specific, after the killing of Eric Garner in Staten Island, uh, uh, the LaBruce uh, forces created uh, what was called the New York City Schiller Institute Chorus. It was a response to a kind of cacophony, a cir circumstance in which a slogan became, I can't breathe. And then you had screaming and shouting, which is the only kind of thing you heard. And as was already referred to before by Matthew, this was a time in which we had to say, friends, not these tones. It was a need to actually cause people to raise their voices, but not raise their voices in screaming protest. And so what happened was that within a period of about a week, we pulled together the beginnings of the embryo or what then became a course that then attracted ultimately hundreds of persons and carried out several conferences and several rather concerts, also symposia, uh, lectures and many other things. Uh, and it was this process which actually in, it was our way of uh, experimenting to see whether or not these principles that we've been discussing so far this, e this afternoon could be applied uh, in reality and in real time uh, with any citizen of the United States that would dare to stand up and use his or her voice. Uh, the person that was the central initiator or at least catalyst for the project in terms of making it actually come together was Diane Sayre. Diane is now a candidate uh, for U.S. Uh, Senate uh, for 2022 in New York uh, uh, running against Chuck Schumer. And she's here with us now, and uh, we're going to turn it over to her. So, Diane, you're also muted. <laughs> we seem to all be uh, suffering from the same thing. The unheard sounds are sweeter, as they say. I hope um, not. <laughs> Well, also, I ha uh, was looking again at this paper from Mr. LaRouche, very prophetic and for the times, and I was struck because shortly after the introduction, he writes, I offer you thus a method for action, which contains the much needed classical alternative to today's real life tragedy of our nation. I present that to you here with the intent to afford you a guide by means by which we can escape from the awful consequences into which the immediate aftermath of a brutish electoral farce now threatens to plunge our nation and also the world at large. Now that's very striking because I can imagine many people, especially in the cynicism the, that I think is one of the most destructive parts of our culture currently and it does make people gullible and vulnerable because they have a cynical approach to understanding human history uh people would say well what do you mean i mean you're talking about poetry and art and beethoven and you know we we just had a total theft of an election there's we have a police state we have censorship so as as Matt said at the beginning, when people would snicker when Eugene McCarthy was reciting poetry, what what's the point of this? What do you mean a guide for action? I want action. I want to jump in my car and ride around with a flag and march in the streets. And of course, these things are very important to do for purposes of solidarity and purposes of classical drama. But they don't necessarily guarantee you get the change in history that's required. So as I was looking at this and thinking about the paradox of LaRouche writing a paper called Politics as Art being a guide for action and the way people think about it, I was reflecting on a book that I read recently by Sun Yat-sen on the Chinese revolution or his efforts uh, to create a nation state modeled uh, with, I would say, Abraham Lincoln with Chinese characteristics. And 
he had a very sharp polemic for why people had failed up to this point. He said people have failed up to this point because they say thinking is easy. It's the doing it that's actually hard. And Sun Yat-sen wrote chapter upon chapter saying, no, the problem is thinking is hard. Doing it is easy. And he gives many examples, starting with um, the question of economy, graduating from barter to a credit system and currency, that the actual issue is to have a conception of what you are doing, to have an intention. And if you have the intention and you have an idea which has been fully formed and thought through, then to carry it out in the real world becomes something that's relatively straightforward. But it's the thinking that is hard. And then he uses the example of food preparation. Um, people who are familiar with good Chinese cuisine uh, may have an idea. I certainly was blown away by the amount of detail that Sun Yat-sen put in his book or architecture. And I think that's really um, part of what we're grappling with today, that uh, Mr. LaRouche had said that Bertrand Russell was one of the most evil people in human history. And at the turn of the century between the 18 and 1900s, he destroyed science because he insisted on reducing everything to a linear deductive system. And I'll give you just one example, which was that Bertrand Russell proposed once the nuclear bomb was developed that the way to keep the world safe was that the United States, really the British Empire with the United States uh, as its lackey, should launch a preemptive nuclear war on the Soviet Union, that we should bomb the Soviet Union back to the Stone Ages to make sure they never developed a nuclear weapon. And then you could in effect have a one world government in which there would never be conflict because you would have one power that had a nuclear bomb and they could get everyone to do whatever they wanted. Now think about having this as your world view, which is very much like the way people see justice or people say, see truth. It's binary action like a computer. It's either yes or no, as opposed to thinking that perhaps there's a higher conception of human identity, which can unite human beings from many different nat nation cultures in a shared mission. And this is not such a complex idea. You might want to consider, not that uh, I think Canada is a fully sovereign nation since the queen is still um, in charge of the country, as you can see by their money. But what's the relation? Do we feel threatened by Canada? Are we worried? Are we having a nuclear arms race with Canada? And people would say, well, why are you saying that? That's absurd. Well, why, why do we think that we have to have a nuclear arms race with Russia or a nuclear arms race with China? In other words, if this is a threat from one nation culture, why isn't it a threat from every other one? And then people say, well, that's just the way it is. Well, no, perhaps there is something above the dynamic into which we have been thrust and which we have accepted being placed, which um, is higher than that. And I think what Beethoven uh, was really getting at with the poetry of Schiller in his Ninth Symphony is something much more in that domain, which is where human creativity resides and also where the relationship of human beings one to the other has to reside. And the power of, of music of this choral principle is that when you are participating in musical performance in that way, you begin to discover this uh, in yourself as a natural part of being a human being, which is distinct from anything that, that an animal can do. So I think in the interest of 
time and furthering the discussion, I'll just stop right there and we can continue. Okay, well, very good. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is to bring up a few respondents to what you've heard. Uh, we welcome, of course, people to ask questions. I think it's questions at schillerinstitute.org, I believe. Um, but what we were going to do now is bring uh, up on screen a uh, few others. And I see uh, Renee Segerson, who has worked with Linda LaRouche and uh, others for over four decades on various elements of our music, and particularly the co-authorship of this manual on registration and tuning. There's Jen Pearl, who's there, who's now acting director of the Children's Institute Chorus, New York City Chorus, as well. She's as a chorus up in Boston. Uh, and there's Fred Haight, who has been writing a series called The Daily Dose of Beethoven. I don't know if he got quite to 250 yet, 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, but he's close. So they're all here. And before we have Renee say something, because I think we're going to go to her first, I think we've got another piece of video from Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, can we roll that at this point? What he this did. man was a genius. Yeah. Norbert Brynion was an absolute genius. He was probably, in a sense, one of the greatest violinists of his time. I compared his performances of certain works with those of other leading performers. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable deal. The Amadeus Quartet was a gem. Now, unfortunately, uh, one of the members the, the, uh, uh, died of a yeah. heart attack in, yeah. while they were completing a recasting mm -hmm. of the entire Beethoven cycle of, of, of the quartets. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was never really produced publicly. Mm. Now, this was a lapse of you know, over 20 years. Yeah. And during this period, this quartet had made great progress. So the death of this violist, who had actually been a violinist in the first place. Mm. And since uh, he gave way to take the viola, because Norbert was taking the lead of the first violin mm -hmm. as the director of the quartet. You can hear the, the changes from the earlier Mozart quartets, that they, the, the earlier recording of Mozart mm -hmm. with the later. Yeah. So you were saying they were working on the Beethoven. Oh, they were, the and you, I mean, Norbert was a genius. I mean, he, he was running around in London. And he came out of, he was an refugee from, from, from Vienna. They went up to, they were first put in prison by the British when they got there, yeah. and because they were German, German speaking. <laughs> and then they decided to get them out of prison and turn them loose under qualified conditions. Mm -hmm. But in this period, he was actually perfecting his tuning. He had the most perfect, perfect sense of pitch of any violinist, any string player around, mm -hmm. by far. His sense of intonation, his sense of insight into the music was absolutely tremendous. Mm -hmm. his, his loss, he's a year younger than I am, or mm -hmm. about a year younger than I am. He's dead. Mm -hmm. We lost one of the great thinkers in music when we lost him. So Renee, mm -hmm. we'll go to you and see how you respond to what you've just seen. All right, can you, you hear just, me? Yes, we can. can. Okay, okay, thank you for doing that. It saved me having to explain certain things so I could get straight to the subject, yes. Yeah, Norbert Brynin was a really extraordinary person who of course came around our movement because um, somebody gave him a copy after a concert, one of our associates gave him a copy of Lyndon LaRouche's commentary on uh, a performance of the opera Fidelio uh, that was done by Lottie Lehman and Lind uh, denounced the performance saying that, that she had missed the point. And Brian Ean read this and he said, I completely agree with this. I'm in total agreement with this. And uh, sometime later he was contacted and said, do you remember the man who wrote this? He says, yes, I totally agree with him. Uh, do you think if I met him that he would answer my questions about politics? <laughs> and so they got together and they became great friends. This was over a period of the 1980s. And a lot of us had the very special uh, privilege of being able to uh, uh, share in their discoveries, including by Lynn's communications to us. Anytime they had a discussion, sometimes which lasted for hours, he was sure to communicate to us some of the essentials. And that's what I want to um, share because it has bearing on what's been said about the tensor, um, what Diane just said about thinking is hard so that people can get a little bit of a window into the hard thinking that Beethoven uh, operated according to, and um, and also uh, uh, this this question of um, 
of, of how philosophy and music, science and music really are one thing. Um, when, during, during the time, approximately during the time that Lind was in prison through communications, Norbert visited him actually when he was in prison. Norbert shared with him what he considered to be uh, Dr. Bernin, who this extraordinary violinist that Lynn was just talking about, shared with Lyndon what he considered to be the primary discovery that he made during his lifetime about classical composition and of the interplay of the work that Mozart and Haydn did together because they were the great discoverers of the form called the string quartet and the effect that this had on Beethoven. Um, and, uh, and he gave a name to the discovery that he made, which he called in German, Motivführung. I'm not gonna translate it literally. The translation that we uh, adopted after hearing what the idea was about was into English, is this concept of motivic thorough composition. It's not identical, but it gets across, I think, more than, I think a, a literal translation would not get across, excuse me for having a little bit of runny notes. Um, and uh, the, the idea that he, that he presented is that he became aware in working through these compositions that there was a tremendous condensation of the underlying idea in the musical composition, which could actually be summarized or in many of the compositions was explicitly presented in the form of three or four notes. And we remember, we're not talking about notes. You've been hearing the great thinkers saying, music is not about notes. It's about something between the notes or a good way to think of what goes on between notes is an interval or what you might call an action. There's an action of the change from one note to the, no to the other. And musicians refer to this as an interval. The interval is not heard. The interval is created in the mind, even though it has no physical existence. And what the great composers starting with Haydn and Mozart, and then later Beethoven reflecting on that, what they began to do was to actually look at a very small interval of action, three tones or four tones, out of which you get two intervals. And how, in a certain sense, this very condensed compression of, of, of musical material could be the seed crystal for the, in fact, functioned as the seed crystal for the entire composition. When one studies the way they did this and then goes back to the great discoveries of Johann Sebastian Bach, who in some sense is the grandfather of all of this, the great, the great genius who, um, who, uh, uh, made the breakthrough that, that, that made the well-tempered system capable of communicating this in the most universal way. I'll leave it to that. Maybe Fred will want to say more about that. But, but when what, what Mozart and Haydn and then Beethoven um, uh, recognized is that this very small interval of action was like, was like a seed crystal. And this is why it's related to this idea of the tensor, because, because it's like a moment of action in this complex unity, the complex unity of an entire symphony. It's actually generated by a seed crystal idea. This was already implicit in what Bach was doing, but had never been made explicit. And with these gentlemen and Beethoven in the most powerful way, realized that by focusing musical composition on this characteristic that you actually would come closer to conveying to the listener, to the audience, to humanity as a whole, the mental process which generated the composition, that it was a moral question because you might, you might say, well, what's, you know, this sounds a little bit complicated. 
most people think that what music is about is beautiful melodies. But as a matter of fact, the melodies are an expression of the potential for this kind of compressed action. They decided they had to start actually writing the compositions from the standpoint of illustrating the compressed action for exactly the reason that Fort Fengler said, that the issue is not prettiness. The issue is not, is not simply stimulating the, um, se the sensuous feeling of pleasure in a, in, a, in a physical way by hearing lovely tones. That, the, that you want to use the beauty of the musical system to penetrate into the minds of people and actually show them how to be great problem solvers, how to think, how to develop new conceptions, how to become conscious of the way that one oneself thinks. So I actually have um, a little bit of an illustration of how, the, of, of, a, of how such a seed crystal worked, which I discovered because of their discussions with each other which I will present in a, in a moment. Let me just say this idea of looking at a pair of musical intervals, a pair, you have two or three notes. If you have only two notes, it's one, it's one interval, then you have another uh, pair of two notes, makes it two, two intervals. If it's three, then it's also the, the two intervals have the third relationship to the, to the third one. So let's take a very, um, um, and, in that, and in that interval, in, those, in that pairing, you actually get what, what Kusa, the philosopher Kusa, would call a minimum maximum principle. This is another one of Kusa's powerful conceptions, along with what Helga has been emphasizing in terms of the coincidence of opposites, the minimum maximum, that in the tiny minimum, you're actually getting the, you're getting the potential for the development of the entirety, which the, then the whole musical composition then brings about. Um, as people may know, I play the cello, so of course I'm very fam I'm very familiar with the composition, the Beethoven Opus 69 cello sonata, which is a super famous composition that Be Beethoven wrote, absolutely beautiful, that was written in the middle of his compositional period. It's considered like the, the one of the greatest compositions of his middle period of of the uh, the period, let's say, from 1802 to 1810, something like that. Um, and it, it was a, it's, a, it's a fabulous work that people love when, when they, hear, they fall madly in love with it when they hear it. And it starts out with a theme, which is, uh, was greatly loved by musicians. Brahms loved it. He wrote another composition with the same theme. With the four tones that it starts out with are, the, uh, are I'm going to say it in, in, in letters, and then I'm going to try to sing it. If somebody wants to correct me, please jump, jump in and do it. I'll try to do it. Um, uh, so you can hear it, but it's the tone A to the tone E, and then it goes F sharp down to C sharp. So it's da 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 da. Sorry, that's not a fifth. Da 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 da. That's the way it starts. So it's down low in the baritone range. Da, 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 da. Four tones like that goes on. The melody goes on. It's a fabulous melody. What Beethoven did, and the reason I was looking at it, is that Norbert and Linden started having a discussion, which was reported to us, that Beethoven's late period, which you saw Ford Fengler uh, made a reference to, that Beethoven's late period was really initiated with the Seventh Symphony. And I found this a very shocking thing to hear. I said, I never thought of the Seventh Symphony as being part of late Beethoven's late period where there's this tremendous tension and all kinds of wild compositional, uh, contrapuntal ideas that come in. I hadn't thought about it that way. So I said, I'm missing something. What am I missing? And when I was studying the beauty of this composition, what I realized is that the first, that it opens up with four sequences of two pairs of intervals. In other words, instead of just four tones, it's 16 tones, okay? And not only that, 
but they're the exact inversion of the cello sonata. So instead of do going dum, dum, it's dum, dum. <laughs> and it's all four tones. The A, E, and maybe you can see this, probably can't, but the A, E is turned around to be E, A, and the F sharp to the C sharp is turned around to be C sharp to F sharp. And this is passed through the whole orchestra four times so that it's 16 tones in, in four pairs. And this became a hallmark of a certain comp compositional method, which then Beethoven brought to a new level of expertise, a new level of accomplishment in a very famous passage in his Hammerklavier Piano Sonata, which is very, very much a part of the late period of, of, um, of Beethoven and of an extraordinary composition in the Adagio Sostenuto, the second slow movement. Um, he brought this to a level of perfection in a remarkable passage, which was then picked up by Brahms to write the fourth symphony. This dialogue across composers, across compositions, itself captures the essence of the way musical dialogue has functioned throughout human, throughout human history, actually, but also casts a real light on Beethoven's own ability to examine the way that he thought and to demand of himself that he always go beyond what he was previously able to do, which was all, he was an extraordinary composer even at a very early age, but to go beyond that and to, to discover new principles of organization, of ordering, which in fact he knew to be a reflection of how the human mind worked. That's why he was able to write music even when he was deaf, because he was focused on the question of the principles of the organization of the human mind. And that, th that by and that he could communicate this to other people. So I don't know whether this came across as clearly as it could, if we, we could actually arrange to illustrate this a little bit more succinctly than I was able to do in, um, in, in this situation. But I think it cast, a I think in particular, the fact that, that this was a discussion between Lynn and Norbert, um, the importance of this. This is the kind of thing that they would talk about for hours. And Norbert's reaction to speaking to Lynn about this was to always say, tell to say publicly to people, um, Lyndon LaRouche knows more about classical music than any musician I've ever met. That's what, that's what Norbert would say. So I just wanted to give this as an illustration of the kind of thing that we're talking about. Thanks a lot. Now, now we're gonna go to Jen. I see you there, you made it in. Hello, Ready everybody. Hope you can hear me. Hi. Yeah. Hi. You're very cool. Yeah, I just, um, this has been an extremely exciting discussion. And I, um, there's been a lot said, but I think one thing I just wanted to introduce is that everybody can understand this and think this way, what we've been going through today. This is not, uh, you know, as, as is often tried to paint with classical music and the classical culture is that this is for some particular portion of the population or this is elite or something like that. This is highfalutin, you know, you have to pay hundreds of dollars to get a ticket to see the opera or something like that. And it's not even that good. <laughs> um, but the issue really here, here really is a culture and a method of thinking and what Renee was going through and um, what Matthew discussed in terms of the uh, role of the artist. Uh, LaRouche talked a lot about um, this, particularly I wanted to take the case of the chorus, just because I think this is something that is really important, especially in the United States and our history, the role of the community chorus. Um, and obviously we've had to take a different approach in the last period uh, under the lockdown and things like that. But LaRouche, um, one time in a discussion I had with him, a group of us had with him years ago, he taught, said, you know, the chorus is like a family. Now, that can have all sorts of connotations. Hopefully it's not a dysfunctional family. No, I'm just kidding. But um, the point is that uh, with a chorus, you have a rehearsal process week in and week out. 
where people are coming together to work on not just uh, trying to coordinate their sounds <clears throat> that are coming out of them, but they're really trying to tune their minds together to become a living organism. <clears throat> and you could, I mean, that's the case in a string quartet and an orchestra. And when you're in that process of rehearsal week in and week out, you are really fighting to um, coordinate and tune yourself with the others around you for something ultimately that's much bigger than each individual inside the chorus. And anybody can participate in that process. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it just brought to mind just this discussion today, the incredible role that the artist has um, to be not in terms of the way it's looked at today where artists feel as though and they often do this, that they have to cater to what's popular in the audience or what they think people want to hear, as opposed to the artist actually playing the role in tuning the minds of the audience and challenging the minds of the audience. Um, and I think that's a similar process within the chorus. So we've had just, you know, over the past nine or 10 months, we had to, uh, our community chorus, we were uh, very committed to continuing this process because of the importance of people engaging in this, even especially when you're locked down and you're isolated and all these things that have gone on because of this pandemic, the importance of people continuing to engage in beautiful music and beautiful ideas. <clears throat> Um, so um, we've expanded that. We've had now, now have international participation uh, in our community choruses, and we hope to, you know, continue to grow that around this project to work on the Misa Solemnis by Beethoven. I uh, have some questions for you, actually, but we're going to go to Fred first, and I think also Diane has a couple of questions that have come in, so the discussion is already beginning. So, Fred, your response to all of this. Can you hear me? Now that you're speaking, yes. <laughs> okay. I, I, my response is it's great. I've really enjoyed uh, all of the presentations. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak a little bit about uh, what we did at the, uh, at the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture because we began the daily doses of Beethoven at the end of March and wrapped it up with the 250th anniversary. And there's plenty of things that we're going to be doing uh, coming into the new year. It was actually your idea, Dennis, to make it a daily dose. I had first resisted that. I was thinking in a traditional kind of way of something, give them time to absorb it. But I think you understood that in, in this crisis time, we need to do something of a greater level of intensity and immersion uh, to give people an idea of, uh, of not just the music, not Beethoven as a musician, but Beethoven as a man, as a genius, uh, and as a total human being, including as a leader of humanity. And so that posed a challenge for me as well, because that was something that I uh, had to delve into. And at, after having write, written a couple hundred of these things, I have a much uh, clearer view of uh, Beethoven than uh, I ever did before. Uh, this guy, one of, one of the things that comes through in Beethoven in his music is his total lack of compromise. And I don't mean the type of compromise that, you know, people in a marriage have to make used to each other. I mean, moral compromise. Uh, the guy would not compromise morally one bit, even though it often cost him a lot. For example, there's a famous story that people like to tell of his break with uh, Prince Lichnowsky, where he says, uh, Prince, you are what you are by virtue of birth. Uh, uh, I am what I am because of what I made myself to be. There are and will be a thousand princes. There is only one Beethoven. That's a very famous quote, but uh, people don't know what actually was behind it. Lichnowsky had been a major patron of Beethoven. Beethoven had lived in his house when he first came to Vienna. Uh, Lichnowsky had financed uh, uh, many of his compositions and his concerts supported him all the way. But then one day, and the Napoleon's army invaded Austria in 1805 and occupied it. They had a more serious invasion in 1809. But one day in between, Lichnowsky played a trick on Beethoven and said, come on out to my country home. 
And he did. And when Beethoven got there, uh, he found that uh, it was full of French soldiers and Lichnowsky wanted him to play and entertain an occupying army. And for Beethoven, that was just completely unconscionable. He stormed out of the place, went home, uh, took a bust of Lichnowsky, which uh, Lichnowsky had given him, smashed it to the ground and never spoke to him again. And poor Count Lichnowsky, who uh, admired Beethoven greatly, uh, was reduced for the rest of his life to climbing up the stairs to Beethoven's apartment, sitting outside the apartment and listening to him practice because he wasn't welcome inside. Uh, similar things like this uh, take course throughout Beethoven's life and his, will, his unwillingness to compromise on anything because of what it meant for humanity does shine through in his music. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is, uh, is what Rene was getting at with the Seventh Symphony, because I remember when Norbert said that, and I had the same reaction. I said, what? Uh, but uh, Beethoven was the guy, there's a certain way in which he almost wasn't interested in music. I, I remember reading a quote from him, and I haven't been able to find it, but one day someone asked him what he was doing, and he said, I'm thinking about thought and the ordering of thought processes. Not just thought, but the ordering of uh, thought processes. And Beethoven was the kind of guy who, whenever you thought you had something figured out, that there was a pattern here that you could follow, he would immediately violate that pattern and force you to follow the uh, development of ideas. If you, if you think, okay, I know what sonata form is, I know what the first subject is, I know what the second subject is, I know what the development comes, then Beethoven takes something like the Seventh Symphony and starts it out with these pairs of intervals, like uh, Rene says. And if you go, ba -da -da -ba -da -da -ba that's not exactly something you're going to sing in the shower. It's not a hummable, recognizable tune. And it also leads in the beginning of that movement through a series of keys that are not what are called closely related keys. In any, in any way of what music theory considers to be closely related keys, these are not. Beethoven has created a geometry which leads you through all of these different directions. A number of famous composers uh, played in the, uh, in the uh, world premiere of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Uh, very famous composers, none of them understood it. Uh, some of them pronounced that he was ready for the madhouse uh, described an odd way of conducting, of crouching and then jumping up. But uh, we take these things for granted these days because we've heard them so much, but he he lasts of his own time in, uh, uh, in, in utter stupefaction. And that took place throughout his life. That happened with the Opus 102 uh, cello sonatas. That happened with his Opus 111 uh, piano sonata, which does not start out with a theme and does not start out in a key. It starts out with the dissonance and takes that dissonance, but it's the same dissonance, which is the characteristic dissonance of Bach's uh, musical offering and of Beethoven's, uh, I mean, of Mozart's uh, fantasy in C minor, and he develops that. So you're in a situation where you don't have a theme to follow. Uh, you can't locate a key. You are being asked to follow the development of ideas in uh, very much, much the way that uh, uh, Rene uh, talked about it. And as such, we begin to see uh, Beethoven as a leader. And the other thing that I'll come back to if we talk a little later is uh, the more I plunge into it, the more I see as uh, Beethoven taking many of his ideas uh, from uh, Friedrich Schiller. But let's go on and come back to that. Okay, well, thanks a lot. I think there's a lot of things that people have that they want to talk about. And uh, Diane has a written question she's going to read off here in a minute. I have a few things I'd like to say also about this or ask about concerning the chorus process. Uh, but uh, let me just set, say to the audience that is viewing this, uh, a lot of people are concerned correctly about the issue of the constitutional crisis facing the United States. But the biggest problem of the crisis is the inability of the population, many people, to comprehend the fact that the present circumstance is one in which you merely have to assert constitutional law. But you can't do that by simply going to a court because the courts themselves are corrupt. So now how do you do that? How do you assert law in a circumstance where the courts are corrupt? That, of course, was the very nature of the, the process 
of the of the formulation of the Constitution uh, as a process over a couple of years, which involved particularly uh, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, Ben Franklin, uh, and others who were also involved in it. But I only want to reference this from the standpoint that the present moment in the United States involving the presidency of Donald Trump is one that sees a crisis, not in terms of the form of government. That's not the problem. It's, it's the ability to actually get at the intent of government as expressed in the preamble of the Constitution and also the Declaration of Independence. And what we're doing here is we're trying to get to the idea of what is it that causes and will cause people to look at the truth and express the truth. And how is that done explicitly in the personage and the product, music creative product of Ludwig von Beethoven, whose 250th birthday was December 16th. Uh, so that's just sort of the background. I just wanted to say that. So Diane, if you have a, a question or a discussion that you want to initiate, why don't you, why don't we go back to you? Okay, sure. This is a question that came in from Madeline in Germany for Matt. She writes, I was thinking about some of the Furtwängler writings in connection to the idea of the coincidentia oppositorum. Do you think that his point of Naher and, uh, and Fanherren, I guess she means, uh, is part of this. He also talks about the relationship between the musical material and the overreaching idea of the composition as a whole. Sorry, I can't provide the exact quotes. Could you please elaborate? Yeah, sure. Um, great question. I'd be happy to. Um, let me just, for viewers, uh, fill out her reference a little bit. Um, in, in many of his writings, Furtwängler talked about how there was a simultaneous uh, process of what he called Nachhören, which is listening to the present, what's immediately occurring in terms of the immediate sound of the orchestra or the performance. Uh, and then also on the other hand, fern hören, which uh, fern is the German word for far. So hearing like um, farsighted hearing, being able to hear the unity of the entirety of a piece of music. Uh, now that's a very paradoxical idea because when we're talking about, for example, viewing a uh, beautiful Renaissance painting or a work of art, uh, you can you can immediately grasp the idea of okay, there is an interaction between the detail and the entirety, the uh, uh, the part and the whole, the um, the each individual element which goes into the composition and what could be called by some as the gestalt, the entirety, how those parts come together uh, within the context of the whole. And it's famously said, you know, the, the, the whole is not the sum of the parts. There would be no way, as Mozart was attributed to say, for example, he's, people asked him, how were you able to compose an entire symphonic work, an entire symphony of, in your head as you were traveling to go to the tavern and then he was famous, he would be able to sit down and just write out the entire overture to Don Giovanni, for example, without ever even uh, having to make a single correction. And Mozart said, because I don't view the music as a bunch of individual parts. I don't view it as a bunch of individual notes. Uh, he said, I view it as if a painter views a beautiful face. So as a painter composes a face in a piece of art, it's not a nose and an eye and a mouth and a chin and an ear and an ear and somehow adding all those together, you get this beautiful face. In fact, you can see from deconstructionist painting like Picasso and others, sometimes that doesn't quite jive. But instead, the painter views the entire the entirety of the beautiful face first, and then all of the parts are just constituent elements of that whole. So that's a, a pretty immediate, you can grasp that as an idea, uh, but when you're talking about a performance of a piece of music, it takes on an entirely new paradoxical form because a piece of music does not exist within one moment of experienced time. A piece of music takes time. It's a form of 
artistic expression which uh, has the element or the dimension of time and it unfolds over the course of experienced time. Um, so then when you begin thinking about what Furt Wengler must have meant when he said uh, the, the, the composer or the performer must experience this simultaneous, this push and pull, this, this uh, dynamic tension between the part and the whole, the here and now and the entirety, the nahurin and the fernhurin. Uh, how would that possibly function if there's no moment in time when that entirety, when that totality can exist as there is when we're just looking at a static painting or something? And so it begins to, uh, it begins to force you to think that the idea of the experience of these parts, the note, the moment, that these are all a shadow. In fact, time itself, as we think about it, as an experience of temporal interpolation of of moment to moment experiences that in and of itself is merely a shadow uh and instead when we say that the the whole the unity of the whole has dominance is actually primary and the parts are merely the constituent shadows of that dominant whole then all of a sudden we realize that that time as we experience it is in and of itself an illusion or a shadow. And instead there is a greater unity which exists above time, outside of time as we, as we experience it. And this is what is creating this uh, sensorial expression which we deem temporal experience. And so uh, he was very he was very polemical when he said that, you know, it's this, it's this striving for the unity of a, of a whole, which was the overarching ideal of all classical compositional method going up through the time of Beethoven and into Brahms. But Furt Wengler said it was really with the dawn of the 20th century and a, the rise of a completely different um, deconstructionist movement in um, music, that that ideal of the unity of the whole was actually thrown out the window. But the funny thing is he said, you know, when they want to celebrate the experience of the moment, the experience of the part, they realize, they fail to realize that in fact, the part cannot exist without the context of the whole which must create it. And so they are left with nothing. So I think this um, this idea, as Madeline termed it, Fernhurin and Nahurin, is uh, it begins to get at some of the epistemological um, insights that you're able to gain through the science of the mind, which we term musical composition and performance. And I do think that's a very provocative idea, Madeline, that this has a uh, a a corollary, uh, a similarity with the idea expressed by Nicholas of Cusa of the, um, of the coincidence of opposites. I mean, as it was presented a few weeks ago, um, very beautifully, you know, Cusa has this idea of the squaring of the circle, the quadrature of the circle, that there's, uh, you, you imagine that the more sides you add to a polygon, the closer and closer you're getting to fitting um, curve fitting that polygon into a circle. But in fact, when you realize that the circle has no sides, uh, the more and more sides that you add in that polygon, the further and further away you are getting from a circle. But he also points out the paradox of striving into uh, the, the, um, the imitation of this higher circle, circular action. And so I think um, when you then realize geometrically that in fact you can create these polygons through circular action upon circular action. You can, for example, create a square or a four-sided polygon by folding a circle and then folding a circle again. And then you unfold that and you're left with this geometrical form of a square. And then you can begin exploring more and more of those, those things. You realize that it is the whole which subsumes the parts, and the parts are these, these shadows of a higher substance called the whole.
So it's a beautiful it's a beautiful question, and I think that this is exactly the pathway in which we begin to think like um, think in these terms that music is not about the sounds we're experiencing, but this is in fact just one more expression of the power of the of the science of the human mind. And um, I should say, you know. Uh, this has direct applications to some of the outstanding paradoxes that currently exist in science. For example, the quantum paradox. This was a big debate which was happening around the time of actually both Furt Wengler and Einstein, which they were contemporaries, um, the Bohr um, Solvay conferences. And Einstein has a, a famous quotation, which I think he actually wrote as an addendum to Max Planck's uh, Where is Science Going? when he says, look, the problem is the solution to the quantum paradox is not throwing out causality, but realizing that causality as we understand it is actually flawed. And we understand causality as this cause and effect over successive moments in time, that one thing causes then causes the next over this experience of temporal time. But in fact, we're thinking about causality as a juvenile thinks about playing the piano, that one note follows the next, and that this is how you play a piece of music. But in fact, maybe we need to challenge ourselves to have a higher understanding of causality in the way that Bach understood it if he was able to compose three, four, and five voice fugues, where there's a completely different geometry of interaction between these motifs, between these voices, between these ideas, which is unfolding in a way which seems to happen over the course of experienced time, but is in fact a projection from something which is outside uh, a, a higher causality than what we would normally perceive. I want to take something up at this point. I believe that we have another uh, an excerpt from Augustine from, an, from a Christmas sermon he gave. He gave many of them. And if Dave, if you have that, if we can play that now or show that now. For who will declare how light is born of light, and how both constitute but one light? How God is born of God without increasing the number of gods? How the statement is made that he was born, as if one were speaking of an accomplished event when, in that nativity, time neither elapsed, becoming past, nor progressed, becoming future, nor was it present as though it were being made up to that moment and was not yet completed. Therefore who shall declare this generation when what is to be declared remains superior to the limits of time, while the speech of the one who makes the declaration passes in time? Augustine, Sermon 195 I think it's important to remember that these sermons were being given to people who could not read or write. Uh, and I think I wanted to in insert that, see if maybe people have a response to what you were saying just now, Matthew, but also to just have people understand that when you talk about the nativity at that time, this is uh, the fourth century we're talking about. Uh, Augustus is born about 354, I think, AD. So this is a sermon he may have given around like the 390s, 400 AD. Uh, and it should also be remembered that Augustine and Ambrose, who was largely his teacher, created, or at least let's put it this way, were pioneers in the creation of uh, the church musical practices, um, which have now become, you know, evolved since that time. Uh, so I just wanted to put that in because this conception that there is a moment which is not contained in chronological time uh, and that there's a way to access a different conception of space time, especially through uh, compositions in the compositional method that Bach, for example, and others uh, were developing, I think is very intriguing for the whole nature of what we're talking about here. So I don't know if anybody else has any response to what was just said. If not, there's a couple of other matters that we have come to our very quick for questions. No? Well, can you hear me? Yes. I just want to say that if you look at the history of the emergence of great classical music over time, it's, it's, a, it's a subject in itself, but going all the way back, I, wouldn't, I don't know about as far back as Augustine, but certainly sort of in the middle between 
Augustine and Beethoven, you know, 1200, 1100, 1200, what you actually see is that the development of musical culture was incredibly important for the development of the, hum of the, of the mental capacities of the population as a whole. I mean, I always think about these wild stories about this guy, Guido of Dorezzo, who was dealing with a bunch of illiterate kids who couldn't read, who didn't know how to read or anything. And he's the guy who pushed the development of musical notation, but he started out by literally telling them what the tones were with, with, with um, symbols from his hands as a way of engaging them. And you know the the development of music involved centuries of actually having a situation where, as we as we face today, where most people could not hold a tone against another voice, um, uh, where this this cap capacity to sing polyphonically uh, uh, comes and goes in populations, and had disappeared, you know, in the, in the period of the, uh, leading up to the Dark Ages. So I I just think that there's a general principle involved where the quality of music that is available to a population and the way that it's presented and the way that it's made available has a huge impact on the mental capacities of the, of the population in general. We have another uh, comment, which Diane will go to, but before we do that, I wanna just again follow up with what you just said. This is uh, from Lynn, and we may also have another um, uh, poster that we'll put up with respect to this. Uh, this is from the article Politics as Art, uh, and he talks about the first, the latter choice of example, the case of the Negro spiritual, has special importance for all among our people of African descent or not, who are oppressed by the sense that life has reduced the common folk to the treatment intended for underdogs or people degraded even to the social status of virtual human cattle. And I don't know if we have this uh, as a poster, but I'll just read it. Uh, if you once come to know, there it is, the way in which the classical principle of composition is expressed in such an excellent and profound way by those spirituals, you should recall that these originated as works of art composed by and shared among successive generations of cruelly oppressed slaves who were each at least partially of African descent. The power of these compositions, which Dvorak, Burley, Hayes, and others have honed to a state of relative perfection, expressed among those slaves the same genius inherent in all human beings. Those spirituals so honed have a special power for all on that account. They should inspire us to recognize that there is no oppression so efficient that it can obliterate the fact of the noble quality of humanity as man and woman made in the image of the creator, a quality innate to each newborn child. And I'll just uh, note uh, uh, that this is re particularly refers to the collaboration between 1892 and 1895 of the, com of the Czech composer Antonin Dvorak with the African-American composer and student of his, Harry Burley, as well as others that also were involved in that collaboration. This was also not something that was uh, merely done or was invented at that time by Dvorak and Burley, it was something that Beethoven and others uh, were involved with. And I, and I think I want a few comment comments about this. One, I want one from Jenny because of something she did with the chorus up there in Rhode Island, uh, particularly last year that I happened to participate with. And I know Fre Fred Haight has done work on the way in which Beethoven was involved in projects very similar to the African-American Spirituals Project. So, so maybe we'll go to, uh, uh, Fred first, and then Jenny, I've got something very specific for you. So, Fred? You're muted again. <clears throat> okay. One of the most interesting groups of compositions by Beethoven are his uh, various collections of uh, Scottish and Irish songs. There's, I believe, about 190 of them in total. Uh, they took place over years. He worked on the project for over a decade. And um, Dr. Barry Cooper, who's the world's authority on it, came to the conclusion that it was not monetary motivation on the part of Beethoven. Uh, it, he saw it as the motivation to uh, develop a monument of folk song art that would last. I see it as a little different. I see it as Beethoven's participation in uh, nation building. Uh, it started in the late 1700s in Scotland uh, when uh, visiting Italian opera singers came to Scotland and 
sang Scottish songs in bel canto and showed the beauty potential, beauty, uh, the potential beauty in these songs. The guy who really kicked off the project was uh, Scotland's national poet, Robbie Burns, who in about 1786 began a uh, project called the Scottish National Museum, where he gathered poems from all over Scotland, uh, wrote words for many of them, and began to develop this as a national project. Later, Burns got involved with a guy named George Thompson, who wanted these songs set uh, as great art. And you have to bear in mind the conditions in Scotland at the time, because after the 1746 uh, defeat of Bonnie Prince Charlie and his Jacobite army at the Battle of Culloden, uh, the British treated the Scots terribly. They began what was known as the Highland Clearances, decided they wanted the land being used to grow sheep, uh, and some, uh, for, I mean, for Simpson projects, for sheep, burned down entire villages, drove people out of the highlands, uh, and, and the, the Scottish highlands to this day have not recovered their population. So that's what was taking place at the time. So uh, this fellow, George Thompson, reached out to Beethoven in 1803, and uh, Beethoven didn't accept till 1809 and got his first set of compositions uh, completed in 1810. Uh, by that time, Robbie Burns was dead. He died in 1796. But uh, Burns, for all his fame as a Scottish national poet, suggested to uh, George Thompson that they also begin a collection of Irish poems. And he volunteered to provide the poetry for him. So uh, Thompson had his Irish friends selling melodies to him. And Burns was sitting there uh, composing the poetry, adjusting the melodies as he needed, so that many of these are known as uh, poems by Robbie Burns. Also in 1894, uh, Robbie Burns wrote a ode to General Washington on his birthday as Washington was president, which uh, got him in severe trouble, uh, and he died two years after that. So all of these guys, Burns, Beethoven, they were fighting for freedom internationally. They were, they were patriots of their own country, but they were also committed to international freedom. Beethoven, in the first set of these Scottish and Irish melodies, uh, because of the Napoleonic Wars, it, he had to send out three sets of them by different means in order to make sure they got through to Scotland uh, because they would be intercepted by the Napoleonic forces. He had to actually employ smugglers uh, to get them across the English Channel. <clears throat> and ironically, he found out that the best way to send them was through Paris because no one would ever suspect that he was going to do that. Uh, but Beethoven stuck with this uh, for at least a good decade after and some of them are just beautiful. Now, he was not always provided with the poetry uh, at the time, but there seems to be a tremendous working of minds together here because the poetry was not always written. These, these people were collecting melodies and assigning poets to write poets to it afterwards, and they sometimes did that uh, and uh, discerned, what, as Burns did, discerned what the, what the melody was, what the beauty of the melody was, and then figured out the words to go with it. But some of them are gorgeous, and some of them are very political. I would take, for example, the uh, the massacre at Glencoe. Uh, that's uh, that's one of uh, Beethoven's first settings. One's done in 1810, uh, and it, uh, it it's an extremely beautiful piece. Beethoven also wrote a, a piece called "Save Me from the Grave and Wise," and say, "Don't let me end up being idiots like them." Uh, there's a transitional theme in that, which goes which becomes the main theme of the fourth movement of his seventh symphony. So his his Irish song, Save Me from the Grave and Wise, becomes the basis of the seventh symphony. And I would just add one thing, since uh, Rene mentioned that he composed the uh, seventh symphony in uh, 1711, uh, Beho uh, Napoleon's resounding defeat in Russia is the next year in 17, in 1812, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I, throughout the Seventh Symphony, we get this sense of joy on Beethoven's part that a great change is about to take place and is possible. But uh, that's the, uh, he also wrote, besides the Scottish and Irish songs, he wrote uh, uh, 23 songs of different nationalities uh, written in the original languages, which includes Polish, uh, Italian, uh, Dan Danish, Ukrainian, Tyrolean, and many, many others. No one knows quite where those come from, but he was involved in the nation and the music and the, 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 the price for freedom that went with the music 
in just about every nation. I want to uh, call attention to something that I was involved in with uh, Jen uh, last year up in Rhode Island. And uh, what was relevant about this was at Brown University was the chorus which performed there, which she conducted, and which was a cappella, uh, was able to, in the singing of I've Been Buked, which I believe is how it began, uh, it evoked the exact um, character, not, it didn't sound like, it evoked the character of the way in which the spirituals uh, were originally sung. Now, the reason I think I can say that is because I happen to have in 1994, three, uh, encountered that in some place in South Carolina, a small church in South Carolina, where they, when they would do the spirituals there, uh, they um, they had no accompaniment, uh, and uh, they would just do them. Uh, and there was a very specific thing that would go on in the congregation, not a large group of people. Um, and they, they used a, a sort of a rhythmic thing they did, but it was not to keep time. It was a way of invoking um, the character of the spiritual. Now, that wasn't done. There was no rocking or mo motion. But, but this thing that you did at Brown University worked exactly. We've had, had a certain experience, uh, Diane, Jen, and others, with Sylvia Olden Lee, uh, who has been now deceased since 2004, uh, but who certainly was largely responsible for uh, making uh, the art of the conducting of these songs available to, to us. Um, but also, uh, recently, uh, Jen, you did this work with Hear My Prayer uh, with a 50-person chorus, and I believe you've been working also with a group from Germany that conduct, that performs a spiritual. So if you could just say some things about it. Yeah, it's actually funny you brought up the um, I've been buked, because I was thinking about that also, because one of the things, the I had a bit of a back and forth with the organizers of that event who were absolutely wonderful in organizing this event last year, but they wanted to start with us um, doing some other sort of singing down the aisle before we sang the I've been buked, I've been scorned spiritual. And I had this idea very clear in my mind that the, that the event had to begin completely silent, silently. And then with this, this lunge, which, um, which I thought the chorus powerfully delivered. Um, <clears throat> but I think, um, I mean, the, the spirituals and uh, are, are so important um, because one, they're in English and there's no media mediation for the singers uh, through language um, translation and things like that. Um, but <clears throat> the uh, while they're relatively musically simple, the emotional quality is extremely challenging and complex for the for the performers. Um, and, uh, we also, we experienced this, um, in a really beautiful way with this, um, chorus in Jena, Germany, uh, who found us, found the Boston chorus because they were planning on, um, traveling to the United States to do a tour. And they found us because they, they love to sing American music. Um, now they sing other American music, popular music, things like that. But they love the African-American spirituals. And so they wanted to do a tour and they found us and we had a whole discussion process over almost a year in planning this incredible concert where they presented um, spirituals. But what was interesting was their concept of the spirituals, although they, have, they love them, they think about them more in terms of, of gospel music. So we really had to have a discussion over many months, but what really organized them was our performance of this them, a totally different idea of how these could be performed. So then when we launched the, um, the proposal of uh, doing a joint project on this wonderful hymn, hymn spiritual, I don't even know how you would really classify this Moses Hogan piece, I'll Hear My Prayer, which was the last piece he composed before he passed away at a very at the age of 48 of brain uh brain tumor brain cancer 
Um, this is a very simple but beautiful piece. People can access the, the recording we did. Um, but this became a joint project and you can see in the faces of the performers when they're performing this virtual course. We weren't all together to do this. We were all recording in our little living rooms across the world. <laughs> in people's faces and the way they're conveying is a real emotional, direct emotional connection, um, which is not, it's not a feeling, it's not a, uh, a sentimentality. Um, I think the important thing just to say about the spirituals, and there's a lot to be said, but is that it's, um, it's a, it's the emotional quality is even if you're conveying the most difficult circumstance, like I've been buked, I've been scorned, you are not angry, you're not enraged. And um, that I think has to come across in the way that it's performed. So that's what I'll say about that for now. Thank you very much. Diane, I know that you're gonna have responses since you worked directly with Sylvia, particularly uh, 25 years ago down in Washington, D.C. on several of these pieces and also on other pieces which were used for a particular play that was uh, done by Amelia Boynton Robinson. But besides that, after your own comments, I think you've got a, uh, another comment from someone who wrote in that will make that our final kind of uh, question we'll answer and then we'll come back to everybody for comments. So why don't you? Spirituals question, actually, I was thinking and, and generally started getting at it at the end of her answer, this other aspect, which is the lack of rage or resentment. And uh, someone very kindly sent me some program notes that were written by William Dawson, who directed the Tuskegee then Institute chorus in the 1950s um, about the power of the spirituals, because of course the people singing them did undergo, as LaRouche said, horrific suffering horrific treatment at the hands of the slave owners and the hands of an entire system which sought to assert that they were nothing more than animals and what occurred as the combination of their own culture uh whatever how how that developed in Africa and clearly singing vocal, there was a great deal of that and um, what their relationship was to Christianity. It, it became clear that, and you hear it in the music, that the slaves saw Christ as their point of reference, that what they were experiencing was in a sense, identical to the suffering of Christ, but also then the victory and the immortality of Christ, which is what you hear in all of these songs. And they therefore were not born out of rage or resentment, but have a quality of a kind of transcendent emotion uh, which takes you above those things. Every one of them, even if some of them seem to have a kind of profound sorrow in them, also have the, the kernel of victory over mortality. Um, and Lynn in this article makes a big point about the polished spirituals where they are polished through classical methods of composition, but uh, they also still remain very simple and very transparent. And as Jen said, and all of us who work on um, getting a true performance of these pieces know that this emotional quality of being willing to go there, as one would say, is really um, critical to to the performance of this music and sylvia lee used to be absolutely adamant she would always say now honey you've got such a beautiful voice but what are you saying you know what's in the words what is the meaning and she often would say that the person down working at the gas station or 
cleaning a hotel room or whatever would be have an ability to convey the meaning and dynamic of this music that it, a beautiful voice was not required although many of these people also have beautiful voices but she really was not interested when she was listening to a performance in what people often get obsessed with with certain things about particular qualities of sound and again back on the first Bengler question it's not in the notes it's not in the sound uh there's something which is above it and and comes through so that's what i can say about that um that music and i okay. guess uh should, should i take up this other yeah, I think we can. What we can do with this is, as people will hear it, I've seen it already. You can read it. Um, everybody does not have to answer what you're about to hear, but uh, we're going to ask all of you to respond as a kind of way of giving not exactly summary remarks, but we've got to bring things to a close. I've got also one last thing for Renee to respond to, but it's a little, little bit different. So go ahead. Okay, I'll read it and let others respond first. LaRouche has presented constantly about the human individual mind as such. It is as if many have misconstrued that notion to mean something outside of universal physical principles. How can we have a human race when some people believe that studying science, music, and being political has nothing to do with what LaRouche left for us to be. So I'll just leave it at that and <laughs> people. All right. So that's the that's the concern of someone who wrote in. Uh, so you can elect to take that up or 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 not. Uh, and I think what I'll do is I'll start with Matthew. Well, I guess I'll what I've been reflecting on over the course of some of the discussion prior to this, and then maybe in response to that question, um, I've been reflecting on what Mr. LaRouche raised at the very beginning of this article that we've been discussing here today, politics as art. And it really is, um, it really does have an impact that he wrote this right on the eve of the 2000 presidential election and all of the resonance between then and now and everything that that entails. But I mean, evoking the image of Abraham Lincoln, reading, quote, quoting whole scenes from Shakespeare to his cabinet during the height of the Civil War, when the when the nation was at war with itself and, you know, uh, the pressing concerns of mobilizing the army and dealing with the war dead and mobilizing the logistics and here he would be in the midst of a cabinet meeting and what he would do, he would, he would quote, he would quote Shakespeare. He would, he would force them to relive these scenes from Macbeth or from King Lear, from these great tragedies. And clearly um, the, the pressure of the, of the time and the, the weight of the responsibility that Abraham Lincoln had could only be uh, he, he could only, he could not look to anything for solace. The only place he could look for the education of the decisions that he solely had to make at that moment was the classical tragic stage, Shakespeare in, in specific. And it's the responsibility, this is a very dangerous time in history, extraordinarily dangerous. And there are, uh, there's a, there's a huge weight of responsibility on our shoulders, but it's the time in which we must emulate Abraham Lincoln. We must have Abraham Lincoln's among us in this moment of history. And what did Abraham Lincoln say to the American people? The malice towards none, charity towards all, bind up the nation's wounds, and what his goal was and what he said several times was that we must bring out the better angels of our nature and today of all days this is the time for for better angels and i think our fellow citizens and those whom we find 
in the positions that we find ourselves in of requirement of political leadership. It's, uh, we must search for these better angels. And where do we find it? We find it through the reinvigoration and the refreshment of our souls that we can get through the experience of, of classical art. So politics is art, as Linda LaRouche said. And for us, maybe as Americans, the analogy of Friedrich Schiller might seem distant with the aesthetical education in the time of the French Revolution, and he knew that history could go one of two ways. And he knew that it was only through the aesthetical education of his fellow citizens that history could go in the way of the good. Maybe that is not an experience which directly connects as much as the experience of the Civil War here in the United States and Abraham Lincoln's directive that we must, we are responsible for the aesthetical education of ourselves and of our fellow citizens. And he knew, as Schiller knew during the time of the French Revolution, that the weight of decisions was upon his shoulders, but his most, the most important priority was that he kept that moral compass, which he gained from the tragedies of Shakespeare. And uh, we can generalize that to classical art as a whole. So that's what's been resonating in my mind uh, just throughout some of the discussion, reflecting on the context, the historical context, which we're having this symposium today. Okay, thank you very much. Fred? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm not sure I 100% uh, understood the uh, question, but I'm gonna respond to what I think it was about, which is that the uh, the challenge has always been, how do you uplift the population uh, to a level of uh, morality where they can actually become self-governing? And uh, Schiller, again, uh, Matt was right to quote that at the end, had some very uh, distinct ideas on that when he was talking about the situation that he had found in the French Revolution, where you had a working class that was just enraged and an oligarchy that was completely enervated and uh, new art, but was it didn't respond to people's needs at all. And he said, you're not going to do it by attacking their maxims. That's like hitting a nail with a hammer. You're just going to drive it in further. You have to intervene on their leisure. And he developed the notion of the instinct for play between our, our sensuous and our intellectual aspects. And said he was trying to give people a better idea of their own humanity through art. And there's there's one place that I really love in his uh, use of the Greek chorus and tragedy, where he says everybody wants to escape. Everybody wants some kind of entertainment, uh, get away from the world for a while. But he, he locates the difference between entertainment and art. He says if it's just cheap fiction, then you get away, you're entertained for a while, and when you come back to reality, it's even more oppressive than it was before. It doesn't help. And he says art should allow people to look at problems that would crush them in ordinary life from a distance through art, develop the strength to deal with that, and then bring that strength back to uh, their everyday lives. So that was the, uh, the mission of art. And, and I think we have to realize that in doing that, we are up against a media, which is probably the biggest uh, source of brainwashing ever. The, uh, you know, turn on your TV sometime. I call it Saturday Night Satan. This is all you got. Everything is designed to turn people into cynics, to teach them that government is bad, the nation is bad, society is bad, family is the only thing that matters. Outlaws are good, criminals are good, be outside the system is good. It, it's a big job. But for the last few seasons, I did teach at the summer school, uh, young people, and we had a combination there of art, of music, and of science, of uh, constructive uh, geometry, which uh, Rick Sanders and other people taught. And it, we didn't succeed in every single case, but we saw that when you present young people with discovery, with an education that involves uh, a discovery, they discovered things for themselves, they learn 10 times faster. Uh, they love it because it's not somebody told, telling them what to think or write, what to write on an exam, uh, but they own the discovery. And that is what 
uh, the great art is about. That's what uh, the scientific method of creating, recreating the experiments is about. And in, in an age in which we're seeing education shut down, this, this province, Ontario, was in lockdown. Kids are going to be sent back from schools. They're not going to be in schools. They're going to be at home. Uh, we're going to be facing children with massive deficits in education. And this, this method of discovery through recreation of the creative process, which involves singing in choruses uh, and uh, pedagogical scientific experiments, I believe, is that is something that we are going to have to figure out how to get through to a broader and larger uh, uh, degree of the population. And I'll, I'll just say one thing on that before I go, because uh, Jenny mentioned the role of choruses. Uh, in the Renaissance, and I, I, Rene mentioned it too, but in the Renaissance, uh, beginning in the early 1400s, uh, education was spread through choruses. Uh, the, particularly in the Flanders area, you had great cathedrals where singing schools were developed uh, and ordinary people learned to sing. And uh, through singing, uh, they could become educated and experience beauty. and even though Renaissance music to us sometimes doesn't sound all that beautiful, if you read Erasmus, who sang in one of these courses, if you read his uh, dedication to the golden voice of Johannes Ockeghem uh, and his writings about it, you understand just how much getting the population participating in creating beauty through courses is part of that, which is obviously what is being done with the Schiller Institute. But we have uh, we have more than that to do. So that's. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking is how, it, how do we fulfill uh, Schiller's uh, obligation to uplift, educate, and remoralize the population? All right, Jen, let's go to you. Yeah, um, well, I'll just relay a story that my husband uh, told me and was asked at a conference in the 90s um, and asked him, you know, how do you deal emotionally with the horrendous condition uh, that has been imposed on the third world? How do you how do you deal with that? And how do you not just completely break down? Um, and he said that he he couldn't break down, that he has he needed to solve the problem and that if he uh, Afraid, he was afraid that if he started crying about the situation, that he would never stop. And I think that's the emotional, the passionate emotional quality that a great leader has to have. And I think that's only really developed through these highest form of classical art and science, because it gives you the passion to know how important your fellow creative human beings are that they're worth fighting for and worth crying for. So that's what I would say on that. All right. Before we go to Renee, I'd like us to put a picture up before she gives her answer. <laughs> we have that, Dave? Yes. Now, now you may answer whatever in whatever way you wish. You may want to describe what people are seeing here. Well, one can pretty much imagine that what you're looking at is Norbert Breinin has just told Lynn one of his famous jokes or stories about Vienna or stories about his experience in life. And Lynn is just absolutely enjoying this. And whenever whenever Breinin did this, good old Norbert, he it, there was always this quality of irony. When, when these guys talked to each other, it, the irony was was very intense. What can I say? It's a beautiful photograph of two beautiful human beings. So are they saving me the chance, the, the obligation to respond to? <laughs> if that's all you have, it's fine. If you have anything else, well, this is I'm it. i say one quick thing, just very quickly. I think we're going into a period of history which is really unprecedented and that there will be tremendous dangers and tremendous opportunities because I think that there's going to be a blowback potential in the population that is uh, beyond imagination after what they've been, the, after the meat grinder that everybody's been thrown into. Um, and we have to be ready for it because we live in a time where things move 
much faster <laughs> than they did in previous moments of history. We have to really be on our toes, which means that one of the most important qualities is how all of this knowledge that we have manifests itself as great strategic thinking. I think in that regard, um, I think, you know, Helga, what Helga has done, I mean, you've said this a number of times, Dennis, but what Helga has done in the past year and a half in terms of designing strategic interventions that really have clout and really have, have, have significance uh, is something that we should be very grateful for because under these conditions, it is thinking outside of the box and thinking strategically, which is going to give us the the um, elbow room to apply the things that we're talking about, and um, and we have to be very we have to be very attuned that when these strategic opportunities uh, come up, that we are going to fight like hell, we fight fight like heaven. <laughs> Um, to exploit them. I think that's something we have to really prepare ourselves for. That's all I wanted to say. All right, so Diane? Yeah, I was going to say something very much like uh, what Renee is saying, just because it is such an extraordinary moment. And I think uh, going back to Sun Yat-sen and Beethoven and Einstein and Lynn, uh, I, well, we we don't have to be afraid. I think that's the thing I really want to tell people. Don't be afraid because human beings by our nature are capable of solving all of the crises before us, provided we are willing to think hard, to work hard, and also to have an absolutely outrageous, uproarious sense of humor and to be able to laugh at ourselves and everyone else, which Beethoven did very well. Okay, so I want to thank everybody that joined us for our panel. Fred Haight, Renee Segerson, Matt Ogden, Jan Pearl, Diane Sayer. And I want to thank everybody for listening. So what we've tried to do today is to give you or to provide you with uh, an idea of nativity. Uh, am I still on? Yes. Okay, I am fine. I'm not seeing my picture. I'm sorry. But but anyway, an idea of nativity, which is different. You know, Christmas comes and people shop and people do whatever they do. But uh, whether they really think about it or have the ability or even given the opportunity to think about it often is a different matter. We're going to conclude today with the conclusion of a webcast that was done earlier today by Helga Sepp LaBruche with Harley Schlanger, uh, and it's her discussing her view of the issue of Beethoven and thinking like Beethoven. And, and to conclude our discussion today, I'd like to go back to what you were talking about in the beginning, Schiller's idea that the pathway to true political freedom is through art and culture. We're still in the Beethoven year, the 250th anniversary of his birth, which will be extended into the next year, uh, why don't you say a few words about the importance of that, given Beethoven's role as one who literally stretched the capabilities of people to think on a higher level? Yeah, Beethoven is, is really the most important medicine for all kinds of um, illnesses. Um, first of all, he has the most powerful, creative, beautiful mind in music, for sure. You can imagine. I mean, I'm not diminishing the other great composers, but Beethoven is a, a whole league by himself. And especially when you, you know, listen to a lot of his uh, compositions, um, it is amazing. Also, he was very anti-oligarchical. You know, uh, Bettina Brentano reports about an incident which may have happened or may have just been a characterization of what is definitely a truthful attitude that in 1812 Goethe and Beethoven met in uh, in Teplitz, you know, which was a health uh, a cure, uh, <clears throat> a place where people go, go went for for medical purposes. So they were happy to meet each other, having big expectations about each other, 
because you know both of them regarded the, the other one as the titan of their uh, titan of their uh, art. But then, in the middle of this walk, uh, the empress passed with a you know a big you know entourage and so forth. And then Goethe said, "Oh, the empress, uh, let's step aside and you know tribute her our respect." Uh, Beethoven said, "No, we should, we should, uh, we we should absolutely not do any such thing because he was not impressed by by you know emperors and kings and oligarchs." So then Goethe stepped aside and bowed and you know <clears throat> showed his uh, showed his honors to the emperors, and Beethoven just walked in between all the you know <clears throat> barons and counts and whatnot. And uh, afterwards, Goethe is reported to have said that this was completely embarrassing and that Beethoven was a wild character. And Beethoven said about Goethe, Goethe likes much too much the air in the courts, much, much too much for a, a, a poet who should actually give the moral orientation for the whole population. So I think that that attitude of anti-oligarchism is also present in the music of Beethoven, and naturally it was the attitude of Schiller in, in everything he wrote. So I think, you know, it is very important that we, in difficult times like this, resort to those, uh, you know, means which can make us better people or can help us to struggle to become better people and become, to think aesthetically more beautiful, to think elevated, to think in terms of flanks, you know, and that's why, you know, I fully endorse that the Beethoven year should be extended really until all concerts which had to be canceled because of the pandemic can actually be played physically. And I would actually like to extend the Beethoven year beyond that until all people are lifted up to think on the level of Beethoven, whatever time that takes, hopefully not so long. But I think that that is the aim because we want to uplift the whole world to become truly human. And that is what Beethoven represents.